Good day everyone. We would like to welcome Dr. Matanda who is going to speak to us on obesity today and we know that it is a huge problem in South Africa. Um, according to a study that was done by Times Live 9 Feb 2021, they said that South Africa is one of the unhealthiest countries in the world in which to live in. Our life expectancy at birth is 63.9 years. The prevalence of obesity among adults is 28.3% compared to Japan, which is the healthiest country to live in. Their life expectancy is 84.2 years and they have low rates of obesity, which is 4.3%. Now, I want you to also just be aware that the CEO of the Heart and Stroke Foundation in South Africa, which is Professor Pamela Naidu, said, as a country, we have one of the highest rates of overweight and obesity in the world, a major contributor to cardiovascular disease, which is now known as a serious comorbidity when it comes to COVID-19. And I'm sure you have noticed what happened with people that were morbidly obese um, um, with COVID-19, but it's just not a healthy space. So thank you, Dr. Matanda, for being willing to share with us um, your knowledge and, and the talk on obesity. But before we start, we're just going to open with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much that we have um, access to information that can help us to live healthy lives, to be better, so that we can serve you better, dear Lord. Um, help that we will not only be hearers, but doers after this presentation. Bless Dr. Matanda's lips, bless our ears, our minds, our hearts, so that we will be obedient to um, what we're going to hear, and help us to be the best in your service. This is my prayer in your loving name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Matanda, thank you once again. Over to you. Please teach us. We are listening. Thank you, Connie, for such a kind welcome. Uh, today, the topic is obesity, the elephant in the room. Uh, this is a very sensitive topic, but we just have to tackle it. The problems that come with obesity are huge. Huge on the person, huge on the family, huge on the community, even on the country. So we really have to talk about it in as much as it is a very sensitive topic, but we just have to, to do it. Sometimes some things just have to be said or they just have to be done. So today it's like I'm putting my finger on a raw nerve and I'm keeping it there throughout the whole uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. Please be free, join us, keep uh, joining us in our talks and give us feedback um, watch you know subscribe to the channel so that each time a new video is uploaded or a recipe is up uploaded or any other information is uploaded you are alerted about it and you will not miss out okay so let's get going with the obesity we're starting in the acceleration mode already okay so let's talk about the definitions. What are we saying when we're saying someone is obese or someone is overweight, okay? So we're basically implying that someone is carrying more fat than they're supposed to be, right? So there is difficult to measure fat per se in a, in a person's body. So there are measurements that we use to try and give us an idea of how much fat you're actually carrying around, okay? So some of these measurements that we use include your BMI, include your waist circumference, include your waist hip ratio. All these together, they try to give us a better way of uh, knowing how much fat you are carrying or at least try to see how much, how much risk do you have. So let's start with the BMI. This one is the most common one, body mass index. How do we calculate BMI? I have gone through it in our previous uh, presentations, but just in case you miss them, I'm going to do it again. So the body mass index, this side of the world, we use kilograms and meters. I know some other people use inches and uh, pounds, but here we use um, uh, kilograms and meters. So when you're calculating your BMI in kilograms and meters, this is how you do it. You measure your weight in kilograms and you measure your height in meters. Then you take your weight in kilograms, you divide it by the height in meters. You get an answer. Let's say that answer, let's call it A. 
So your kilograms divided by your meters equals A. Then you take that A and divide it again by your meters, right? So at first you take kilograms, you divide them by your meters, that's your height in meters, you get an answer A. That answer A that you get, you divide it again by your meters, which is your height, then you get your BMI. The final answer you get is your BMI. So the formula is height over this is weight over height squared. But this is a simpler way of putting it across so that even if you don't have much math background, you can still calculate your own BMI. So when you have calculated your BMI, your weight divided by your height in meters, your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters, you get an answer A. You take A, you divide again by your height in meters, you get your BMI. So if your BMI is like 19.5 to 24.9, that's normal. 19.5 to 24.9, that's normal. Uh, 25 to 29.9, that's overweight. And then above 30, um, above 30 is obese. That sort of leaves 30 as like hanging in the in between grayish area where you're overweight, obese, you're like on the borderline, okay? But according to WHO standards, they only start saying you're obese if you're above 30, okay? So... And above 40, if you get 40, then we say you are severely obese or we say we call it morbid or uh, morbid obesity, right? And I'll come back to these figures as we go throughout the presentation and you see what I mean, okay? How, how the, an increase in your BMI actually relates to the comorbidities and your risk if you get sick. Then let's look at the waist circumference. I'll show you a slide after this one with the waist circumference. So let me skip it a bit. Let me go to the waist hip ratio. Okay. So this waist hip ratio comes about because some, some scholars will be arguing that um, BMI just measures your whole weight, doesn't really look at weight, dis a weight distribution, and um, just gives you an idea of how much fat you're carrying. But we are saying that the fat that is more dangerous is visceral fat. That's the fat that's surrounding your abdominal organs, like your liver, your pancreas, your spleen, your, your intestines, right? So that fat that's surrounding your visceral organs is the one that is very much uh, da more dangerous than subcutaneous fat. Some actually argue that subcutaneous fat is actually protective than, uh, than, than visceral fat, which is the, the dangerous type of fat to have. So when you use the waist to hip ratio, it gives you an idea, a better idea of putting everything into perspective. So if you are a man, your waist to hip ratio must be one or less. So if you take your waistline, you take your hip line, you divide you, the waistline divided by the hip line. If you're getting one and below and you are a man, then that's okay. If you are a woman, it is supposed to be 0 0.85 and below. That's because women are expected to have bigger hips, right? Women are generally expected to have uh, bigger hips because of their build and their, the hormones that they have. So if you see that as a woman, you're not having a tummy which is bigger than your hips, that's a huge problem, okay? So your, your waistline must always be smaller than your hip line. So your, your waistline divided by your hip line, you must get a ratio of less than uh, of 0 0.85 or less. Let's talk about the waist circumference, right? So the waist circumference differs with ethnicity we realize that people of Asian descent have got lesser centimeters that they recommend than the rest of the world. That's simply because people of Asian descent are usually shorter than the average person uh, comparing with the rest of the world. So because they're generally shorter, their measurements are going to be a bit lesser than ours, the, uh, the, the rest of the world uses, okay? So here are the recommendations that they give. They're saying if you're a man, your maximum waist circumference must be about 94 centimeters and a woman, 80 centimeters, right? If you're a man and you see that your waistline has gone to 102, that's a danger sign. They actually say just by seeing that your waistline has gone to 102 as a man, you need to visit your GP and get some checks done because that's like a danger line that you are already. And for a woman, once your waistline is 88 centimeters 
or above, you also need to, the recommendation is visit your GP, get some screening done. Uh, you need to be screened for the risk factors, for the cardiovascular risk factors, risk factors for diabetes and the rest of the stuff so that you get help uh, earlier. Okay, so these are the figures to work out with if you are not Asian. For Asian, uh, people of Asian descent, this one, uh, you know, the measurements are a bit less than this. Okay, so how big is the burden of obesity? You know, I always want to put things into, you know, for us to really, into perspective, for us to really know how big is this monster that we're dealing with. We always say obesity is on the rise. What, what are the figures? So in 2019, there were 38.2 million children under five who were either obese or overweight. That's a huge number for under fives, you know? And obesity runs across. We have childhood obesity, we have teenage obesity, and we have adulthood obesity. It's running through all age groups. And childhood obesity is very scary because it puts our children at the risk of having non-communicable diseases, even at an earlier age. We'll see our children having what used to be called adult onset uh, diabetes or uh, uh, diabetes mellitus, or, you know, they, they get almost like type two diabetes mellitus, and yet they are not the age which is really expected for them to get type two diabetes. Their children, we expect type one diabetes in children, but you realize that more of our children, more of the young people are now being diagnosed more of type two than the type one, which was typically uh, affecting that age. And almost about 2 billion people in the world are obese over it. That's a huge number. You know, that's, that's a big number. It's not a joke. And in the United States, they say that they are predicting that by 2030, one in two would be obese. That's, that's scary. Okay. And uh, in South Africa, like Kony was saying, that obesity is on the rise. About 30%, uh, you know, people obese. Uh, that's an average, but we know that women are almost 40 percent, and men are about 30 30 percent uh, obese. But the 30 percent is an average, um, an average risk for, for uh, the average prevalence, rather not risk, the average prevalence for for obesity in South Africa. That basically means one in three, you know, one in three are obese. That's that's not uh, that's not that's a big percentage, you know. If, if we are to put it that way, that one in three South Africans are, are obese or overweight, that's, um, that's, a big, that's a big number. And one in five of children up to the age of 19, uh, one in five of children up to the age of 19 are obese. I mean, that's, that's scary. If, if our young generation are already growing up this big, the future is not too bright for them. You know, they say that the world had gained so much life expectancy by dealing with cardiovascular disease early. You know, uh, people are reducing their, their lipid, lipid levels. And when someone is diagnosed with diabetes, people are being treated rigorously. And because of that, we were gaining some mileage in as far as life expectancy is, uh, is concerned. But now the concern is, obesity is going to reverse all of that. All of that gain that we probably had gotten by managing our diabetics better, managing our cardiovascular risk factors better, that's being threatened to be reversed by obesity. So it's such a, it's such a big such a big burden and in developing countries you know sometimes a lot you know like not a long time ago about three or four years ago we used to think that uh, obesity is really only for those countries that are rich you know but now it is actually on the rise in developing countries those countries that are not actually classified as rich countries you know they are those countries we which are um, classified as the poor countries and most of these countries are here in sub-saharan sub africa it's like the developing countries are having a double-edged sword. On one end, they have undernutrition, they have kwashioka, they have marasmas, they have all diseases of undernutrition. And on the other hand, they have the other spectrum of malnutrition, which is obesity. And 
in this at this point in this world for the first time in human history we have more obese people than undernourished people and more are dying from obesity than from undernutrition mm -hmm. so you know when you when you look at videos sometimes you see videos of children from different developing countries like the poor countries you really see children starving you see adults starving you know you see for getting very skinny you can count their ribs and you can you you really see that this these guys are lacking food but we are saying that at this point in the history of humanity more people are dying for being overweight than from starvation mm. more people are at this point in human history of the people who are alive there is more people who are obese than those who are starving at this point that's a that's a you know that's a wake up call to say where where are we heading as humanity we need to take you know a deep breath and put our antenna up and start thinking on what exactly is you know what exactly is going on and developing countries are facing both on the other hand there is a good population of people starving and on the other hand there's a good population of people who are overweight or obese so it's 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 really like a, a like a double a sword for them so what's at stake when you are talking about obesity what why are we making noise why are we jumping up and down about obesity why are we concerned i want to explain one phenomenon okay there is a process called inflammation when inflammation happens in the acute setting you benefit from it it is good for you when inflammation happens chronically it becomes dangerous to you so when someone is obese they have chronic inflammation what do i mean by inflammation inflammation is a process that involves your vascular system it involves your immune system different immune cells including your 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 especially your vascular uh, your vascular system the endothelium of your blood vessels in the end there are five cardinal points that we look for, for for us to say this is inflammation i'm just trying to break this down in layman's terms right nothing too medical here so when inflammation has taken place you realize that the place where the point that is inflamed uh the cardinal points that we look at are temperature so the, that point is what it is red it is swollen it is painful and it loses its function so those are the five cardinal points for inflammation it is what it is red it is swollen it is painful and it loses its function so when this happens maybe you have just had an, an infection and the um, the your 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 immune system responds there is the natural killer cells come the macrophages come the cytokines are produced you know that that area where the, the pathogen is or where the invader is inflammation happens and when that inflammation happens it contains it contains the infection that's about to attack you and once that is done then your cells also clean up the debris of any dead cells or any dead uh, tissue that's there and you are back to normal no more swelling no more redness no more pain no more uh, being hot no more loss of function you back but when this process happens over a long period of time what we call chronic inflammation then your system is in a your 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 whole body is in a chronic state of redness chronic state of pain chronic state of uh, swelling chronic state of um, pain a chronic state of loss of function all those cardinal points of inflammation are happening at a you know they're happening chronically over a long period of time this is going to cause problems for you most of the health problems or the health complications that come from obesity is because it is a chronic inflammatory process let me repeat this when inflammation happens short time acutely good for you but when it occurs as a chronic process then it is a huge problem the same applies with diabetes it's also a state of chronic inflammation your body is in overdrive all the time 
because of the change in physiology of all the parts of your body. That is why diabetes or obesity give you, it gives us uh, complications that are almost head to toe because no part of the body is fed. The other thing that I want us to understand is those fat cells are not dormant. They're actually producing hormones, different types of hormones. So because those fat cells are active, the more you have of them in your system, it means the more uh, uh, risk you have of having hormonal imbalance of all the different types of hormones that they produce. So once that is happening in your body, you know that complications will follow. And these complications are really going to be head to toe. I'm going to go through all the complications now, and I'm sure you will see that obesity really gives you complications that are head to toe and complications that threaten your life. So here's the first thing. Death. When you are obese, you are at high risk of dying from anything. It's called an increased risk of uh, all, from all cause mortality, right? You, you, you die from anything. You, your risk of dying from anything is very high. And it, it's a J-shaped graph. What I mean by J-shaped is, you know, when you're drawing a graph, it's like flat, 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 and shoo, it goes up. It doesn't like slowly go up, slowly, 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 no. It's like when it reaches BMI 25, your risk of dying from anything, just all of a sudden, boom, it's up. So the graph is like a J because it's almost flat, 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 slowly increasing. You hit BMI 25, it goes up. And you see that the risk, the risk from BMI 25 to BMI 30 to BMI 40 is different. When you hit BMI 40, you are cutting your life expectancy by at least 10 years. You've already cut down your life expectancy by at least 10 years. And when your BMI is like, it's at 30, you are cutting down your life expectancy by about two to four years. So each year that you carry that excess weight, you keep cutting down on your life expectancy. And what do I mean by you have a risk of dying from anything? I am saying, if two people, one obese, one normal weight, get involved in an accident, get the same injuries, the person who is obese is at higher risk of dying from those injuries than someone who is not obese. I'm saying if two people, one who is obese, one who is a normal weight, both get pregnant, both go through cesarean section, I am saying that an obese person is at a higher risk of having complications from that same cesarean section, um, or even dying from it than the normal weight person. So even if you do not have a disease, I know there are those people who are healthy, obese people, you know, they are overweight, they are obese, their BMIs are sitting somewhere around 35 or 40, but they tell you, I don't have diabetes, I was checked, I don't have hypertension, I was checked, my cholesterol is normal, I was checked, so what's the problem? You might not see the problem now, you are like this healthy, obese individual. But if, uh, if, you're, if you are just going to get stress, say, for example, you get involved in an accident or you go and have a cesarean section or you need an operation for any cause, or if you get any form of infection, your body is under acute stress. You do not cope as much as well as your normal weight counterpart. So even if you are not sick right now, but you know that you're carrying excess weight, you're carrying excess fat than you're supposed to be, you are at risk. You need to do something about it, okay? In 2015, there's been about 4 million deaths recorded due to obesity-related causes. That's 2015. I know we, we have a pandemic on our hands. We have COVID-19 on our hands. It hasn't yet killed as many as 4 million people in one year. So, and if you see the, the numbers that are pushed in COVID-19, like Connie was uh, saying, they are also falling back to obese people, you know? So most people who are overweight or obese who get COVID-19, I'm going to show you the slide, COVID-19 and obesity. You realize that the numbers that get, that balloon in COVID-19 deaths are also being pushed by obesity. So, and at this point in time of the human history, obesity has surpassed smoking 
as the number one cause of preventable disease and disability. So obesity is really now the elephant in the room. You know, it's, it's, pass, it's surpassing everything else. It is, it is the fastest growing epidemic that we have as humankind at this point. So the risk of your you know, psychosocial issues, uh, nervous system issues with obesity, there's the stigma that comes with obesity. You know, when someone is carrying around a heavy weight, you know, they are more sensitive and some people point fingers at them and they don't feel, they don't have the best of confidences, you know. They're given names, uh, fatty boom boom, uh, uh, you know, baby hippos. They are given different types of names, you know. Uh, and people make memes, you know, this, side, this time of, um, of, uh, of uh, social media with different memes. I once saw one meme where there was a hippo which was chasing an obese man and he was shouting help. And someone was saying, I don't usually interfere when siblings fight, you know? So this person literally telling the other person who is asking for help that, no, you and the hippo are, are, are the same family, your siblings because of your weight. So a lot of those and the stigma around obesity, and this is what makes this topic sensitive. You know, before we started, we said this is a very sensitive topic because it's a, sens it's a topic that's so much associated with stigma. When growing up in my country, we used to sing a song, uh, uh, you know, if I literally like loosely translate it from my language, it was someone has finished mama's loaf of bread. Who is it? It's the fatty boom boom. You see? So this is kids singing. And we used to sing and play. And we, it also increases on the, on the stigma. We used to sing, uh, dunda, ape the rofra mama. We are saying the fatty boom boom has finished mama's full loaf. So this is a kid singing. It, they're innocent, they're singing, but this is like, it's in the society. And it makes people who are overweight have this very low self-confidence. And some of them end up uh, being depressed. Uh, they need some try to kill themselves. Some end up trying life-threatening uh, surgeries to try and get the weight off and maybe try and fit in the in the society there's so much stigma that surrounds people who are um, people who are obese depression is a common thing in in obesity both as directly physiological effect of being obese and also from the stigma that comes around uh people who are people who are obese okay uh dementia is also a very common uh, uh it's okay, also occurs more commonly in obese people than in normal weight people Dementia is a very painful disease, you know. It affects you and it can actually, you know, it can break your social support system. Uh, I have seen so many patients who get diagnosed with dementia and we cancel the families. We tell them, you know what, your relative is never going to come back to be fully conscious. He's going to forget people. He's going to forget where the toilet is. He's going to forget what date it is, what day it is. He's not going to be able to work. Someone has to completely, to always watch over them. And the family is be like, no, we can't take him. You have to find a home for him, place him somewhere. And then now it's COVID-19. Uh, most homes are not taking people in. They're being a little bit more cautious because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the end, they just stay there. They just stay in the hospital. They have nowhere else to go because of the diagnosis of, uh, of dementia, whatever cause of the, of the dementia. But now we know that being obese puts you at a higher risk of dementia. And when you are now a, a person who's suffering from dementia, you depend on the next person for your function. You can't function by yourself. You really have to depend on, on, on people. There's nothing that's as painful as your mother forgetting you. Can't your mom can't recognize you or your dad can't recognize you. You can't, or your, your, you know, your daughter is now, now has dementia, even at an earlier age, and they can't help themselves. Dementia is such a, it's such a, a bad disease that affects our psych psychosocial structures. Then we have stroke. People who are obese are at a much higher risk of getting strokes than those who are of normal weight. So if someone has got 
diabetes and they're overweight or they're obese, you know that their risk of having stroke is high. And the problem with this stroke sometimes is that they, we call them microvascular uh, strokes. They happen, you know, uh, small tiny dots in your vessels round and round and round. And when they happen, when they damage enough brain tissue, then you, 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 you can't function. You know, you, you either get microvascular dementia or you end up having a major stroke. And when we do the CT brain, we tell people that, no, you know what, your relative actually didn't have a heavy stroke that you, we know, we all know that someone wakes up or someone was waking and then the whole side gets weak, the mouth goes to the side, the arm, they can't use their arm, they can't use their leg, they can't speak, their speech is fled. That's the big stroke that everyone knows about. But there's also these tiny little strokes that happen and you care about your own business, you don't even get a signal that there's a stroke happening and by the time we realize yeah, we're having all these strokes, it's irreversible. We can't do anything to what? To reverse it. And all we can do is to cancel mostly your relatives because most of the time when you get to this point, you are not in a state where you can understand anything. You are now confused and you are going to be confused for the rest of your life. There is no reversing it. Okay. So uh, these are the other effects that obesity can have. Remember we said that uh, this presentation is not exhaustive. I'm only touching on the tip of the iceberg. Okay, the cardiovascular uh, risk, the risks that you get with obesity include heart attack. So we know heart attack is a big risk factor for having, uh, I mean, sorry, obesity is a big risk factor for having heart attack. So when we are uh, uh, evaluating someone who has a heart attack, we try and find out what are their risk factors. The risk factors include your ethnicity. We know that more Caucasians are more, uh, Caucasians and Asians are at more risk of having strokes than those of uh, black African descent. Being male, if you are male, you are at a higher risk of having uh, heart attack than women. If you smoke, you are at higher risk of having heart attack. If you of advanced age, you are at higher risk. If your, your cholesterol is, is too high, you are at higher risk. If you are obese, it's a big factor. You are at very high risk of having, uh, of having a, a, a heart attack. And if you have any of the diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure, you, that also increases your risk of having heart attacks. And surviving a heart attack is always a miracle. You know, some people never survive heart attacks. Some people do survive them, but their quality of life is very much deteriorated after the heart attack. Heart failure is another thing that comes uh, when you are obese. So we know that obese people are at a higher risk of having heart failure. They're also at a higher risk of having hypertension. Venous thrombosis means clots in your veins, okay? So people are at higher risk of having like what we call deep vein thrombosis, from, you know, you, you don't, you cannot explain it, but you come to the hospital, one leg is getting swollen, the other one is not. We do a scan, the scan we call a Doppler scan, and we tell you you have a clot in your veins. Being obese makes your, you to, to be hyperviscous, so you are at higher risk of having clots. And also stroke, stroke fits in also as under the cardiovascular, it's actually a cardiovascular event, really. So, and stroke is a clot, uh, only this clot is now happening in your artery. The arteries that supply your brain, your brain tissue and heart attack is the clot that's happening in the arteries that supply your heart. So um, obesity is a hyperviscosity state where your blood tends to want to clot, okay? And this clot can be anywhere, you know, in your heart, in your brain, in your veins, you are at risk of, uh, of, of all these clots. When you look at your lungs, obesity causes what we call obesity hyperventilation syndrome. It's actually called obesity hyperventilation syndrome because it is caused by obesity. When you are obese, you hyperventilate. You do not have, you know, when you breathe in oxygen, the oxygen gets to what we call the alveoli, those small grape-like bunches in your lung, and they're very close to blood vessels. So because they're very close to blood vessels, the oxygen in the air that you have breathed in and the carbon dioxide in the blood vessels 
exchange, right? This is a very thin membrane. The air that you are breathing has got more oxygen. The blood that's coming has got more carbon dioxide. So things move from a region of higher concentration to a region of low concentration. So your blood is a region of high carbon dioxide concentration. Your, the air is a region of high oxygen concentration. So they exchange. Oxygen gets into the blood. Carbon dioxide gets into the lungs and you breathe it out. We call that the uh, ventilation perfusion uh, uh, dynamics, right? So when you are obese, this process is disturbed because of the fat cells, okay? So you are going to breathe in, the blood is going to flow, but this process of exchange is not going to be effective. So obesity is a carbon dioxide uh, retention state. You won't be able to breathe out as much carbon dioxide as you are supposed to, and you are not able to breathe in as much oxygen as you are supposed to. So in as much as air is moving in and out your nose, it's actually not getting to where it is supposed to go. It's not being delivered there because the ventilation perfusion dynamics are all not functioning well because of the excess fat that you carry. Sleep apnea, it, is the one usually sleep apnea and obesity hypoventilation syndrome are, 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 are linked. And most of the time, you see people who are obese who have very thick necks, and when they sleep, they snore, and they're always tired during the day, they feel sleepy, they have not rested, and sometimes they have high blood pressure as well. You know, that, that uh, increases you know, their chances of having what we call pulmonary hypertension, which is my next point there. Pulmonary hypertension, this is when we're, we're talking of the right side of your heart. It's connected to the lungs uh, via the pulmonary vessels, right? So there is increased pressure in those, in those vessels and your right heart has to pump through that increased pressure. And that actually causes the right side of your heart to get bigger. And when your right, the right side of, side of your heart gets bigger, you cannot move fluid nicely. And then someone comes, they, they, can't, they can't walk a distance, they are already short of breath, they're having, their legs are swelling, uh, they, they, uh, uh, they, they see that their body, there is always fluid, and the fluid can continue going up and up and up until even up to the waistline, you see someone comes late, they present late, and the edema or the fluid retention has really gone up and now they have to be on water tablets. We actually have to give them injections at first to try and help their system to get rid of the excess water. We now tell them to stop drinking as much because their, their system cannot handle the excess, uh, the excess fluid. And these people who have pulmonary hypertension end up needing home oxygen because they cannot breathe for themselves. They are retaining carbon dioxide uh, and the oxygen saturations are going down. So in the end, they will need a home oxygen and they will need machines, the CPAP machines, the machines that are called CPAP machines that they uh, put on while they are sleeping to try and help them to, to breathe. These are all complications that come because someone was carrying excess fat for a significant time. So I, I hope if there's someone listening to me who is caring more than they are supposed to, is going to be scared enough <laughs> to start some action. Okay, then we also have a higher risk of asthma. Generally, obese people are at a higher risk of having asthma, and especially the one that we call non-allergenic asthma. You know, asthma is usually, we usually know it as an allergy. You, 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 are, you are allergic to dust, you smell dust, and then you get an asthmatic attack. But these people who are obese, Okay, they have this asthma, which is not related to a particular uh, 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 allergen. They just get asthma attacks because they, they, uh, they, their lung system, their pulmonary system is so distorted. It's not functioning well. They are just going to have hypersensitivity reactions even when they do not have uh, a specific allergen that's causing it. Okay, moving on, we're talking about infections. Obesity increases susceptibility to infections. Any infection, think of any infection, any bacterial, viral, parasitic, 
whatever infection you can think of, obesity puts you at a higher risk of catching it, you know? And they have also seen that through different studies that more people who are obese get affected by influenza and they are at a higher risk of being admitted for influenza. Influenza is like that common cold that we knew before COVID, right? Most of the time, people get flu. They take some analgesia, some stop pain. They take some, some here, take some grain fast, some take some panado, some take some med lemon or some make their own concussions. They take garlic, they take onion, and they just feel you know, the headache. They just take an analgesia. They drink more water. And, you know, three to five days, it runs its course and you are fine. But with obese people, it usually doesn't happen that way they are at a higher risk of being admitted for influenza and of dying from influenza. So they are really quite at a higher risk, both of getting the infection and of getting a severe, of getting severe disease when they get the infection. Now this slide is about the COVID-19, right? This is what we have gathered so far. We know that COVID-19 is really an evolving um, uh, subject. Uh, as days pass, people discover more things, people discover uh, uh, other important things that they hadn't noted before, and people reverse what they have thought they had known uh, regarding COVID-19. And it has really affected everyone around the world. Most countries have been um, infected and affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So in re with, regards to, with regards to obesity, it has been linked with increased morbidity and mortality of COVID-19 pneumonia. What I mean is obese people are at a higher risk of getting COVID-19 and of dying from COVID-19. Remember your BMIs. We said obesity is a BMI above 30, or if you're having your waistline above, above 80 as a woman, if it is above 88, it's even more danger. It's all even a more danger sign. If you are a man, we're looking at 94 centimeters. And if it gets to 102 centimeters, it's even more dangerous. If you're using your waist to hip ratio, we're talking of, we're saying men must have a waist hip ratio of one or less. Women must have a waist hip ratio of 0 0.85 or less. So according to all these measurements that I've given you, whether by your BMI, by your waistline, by your waist hip ratio, especially using your BMI though, this is the one that has been used in most, uh, most, um, most studies. If by any of those you are obese, this is your risk. By any of those measurements, if you are above what you are supposed to be and you are actually classified as obese, this is your risk. I'm, talking to you <laughs> people who had obese who were obese and got covid-19 they were at a higher risk of getting of needing intubation they needed life support and they've also shown that it's another j-shaped curve with bmi uh, between bmi and risk of death at 21 days so you get covid-19 by day 21 your risk of dying, if you are obese, it's a J-shaped association, okay? So the higher the BMI and the graph goes up. So if you just increase your BMI, like from 20, like maybe from 30 to 31, already those two, even though the BMI sound close to each other, the risk will be maybe double, you know? Because J is like a very sharp increase with a, a very sharp increase in risk with a little increase in BMI, especially when your BMI goes beyond 25. So they put together, this is like a meta-analysis, they put together 75 studies and they've realized that people who are obese, they have a 46% higher risk of being COVID-19 positive. They have a 113%, 113% higher risk of being hospitalized. They have a 74% higher risk for ICU admission. And this is the scary one. 
48% increased mortality. So people who are obese, including those healthy obese individuals, we, we have seen them in different hospitals succumbing to COVID-19 pneumonia. And this, this pandemic has really given us a wake up call on how much we need to do on the non-communicable diseases. We saw how COVID-19 has been, um, uh, you know, has been taking away our relatives, especially those who had comorbidities, the non-communicable diseases, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, obesity, they are at the top of people who got serious effects from COVID-19. These are the people who got most severe disease, who needed intubation, who needed ICU, who also died the more. If you look at the percentages, people who died who were normal weight, no comorbidities, and people who died who had comorbidities and those who were obese, you can really see that the graphs worldwide, they've been the same. The more comorbidities you have, the higher your risk of dying from COVID-19. The more obese you are, the higher your risk of dying also from COVID-19. The terrible twins, obesity puts you at a very high risk of having diabetes. Here's what they've actually seen. It is that when you are obese, you already have insulin resistance even before you get to the point of having high sugar readings. I know that people who are obese, who get checked and get no more sugars, they're like, ah, I'm fine, my sugar was okay. But here's the thing, even if your sugar is okay now, it has been proved that those who are obese actually start having insulin resistance before they get to the point of having hyperglycemia. Before they get to the point of having a high sugar reading, they're already having insulin resistance. So by the time they are going to be diagnosed of diabetes, they are most probably going to be having complications already. And also complications that are associated just by insulin resistance. You know, that's a topic for another day. Insulin resistance is a huge thing. It is the driver of what we call the metabolic syndrome or previously, which was known as syndrome X uh, uh, some time ago. So already, even before you get diagnosed of the actual diabetes, you are already having insulin resistance. And once your body stays in this condition of insulin resistance, it is only a matter of time before you get diagnosed of diabetes. And it is only a matter of time before you start having complications of diabetes. Uh, obesity and diabetes are like really ter terrible twins. And when they come together, your risk of cardiovascular events is even doubled. It's even, it's, 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 you know, it's multiplied. Diabetes itself is a risk factor for cardiovascular events. Obesity is, uh, uh, obesity is a risk factor for cardiovascular events. And when you have both diabetes and, and uh, obesity, you are really at a very high risk of having heart attacks, of having strokes, of having heart failure, of having hypertension, of dying from complications of this. So this is a serious matter that people have to sit down and take very seriously. Fatty liver. So uh, previously, this was called non-alcoholic fatty disease or uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is represented by this NASH, but now it is called metabolic uh, syndrome associated, um, metabolic associated um, fatty liver disease or Marfield instead of the Nashfield that we used to know. So when you are obese, some of that fat is going to be deposited into your liver. So you know that you take a person who is obese for a scan, they are probably going to find for an abdominal ultrasound scan, they're probably going to find some fat cells sitting in there. And when you get the fat accumulation, we have steatosis and inflammation, that word again, inflammation. We have steatosis and inflammation happening. And then we have fibrosis. Once fibrosis starts happening, we get cirrhosis, right? And from cirrhosis, we get liver cancer. So from here, you can go backwards. But usually once you reach here, once you go to the cirrhosis part, it's non-reversible. Okay. And 
Uh, let's keep tuning in. When we get to the end, you'll see how to reverse from here going backwards, how to reverse that fat that is already accumulated in your, in your, in your liver. Cancer. In the United States, overweight and obesity is estimated to have caused 40% of all cancers in 2014. 40% of all cancers, that's a huge number. Cancer is such a monster. It is a monster for both the health system and for the patient. And you get this figure that more than uh, about 40% of all cancers had a direct link to obesity or overweight. That rings a bell. If that doesn't ring a siren, I don't know what will. <laughs> we really have to, to wake up and do something about our health. If we are carrying excess calories, okay? If we're carrying those excess kilos of fat. Multiple cancers have been directly linked to being obese, including endometrial cancer, kidney, gastric, colon, rectum, pancreas, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, liver cancer. Liver, I've just shown you the slide. All these cancers have been directly linked to, to um, obesity. But if you read widely in the literature, you actually see that obesity almost has a link to most of all the cancers that we have known. Most of them. Obesity has a link. We're looking at your muscles and joints, osteoarthritis and gouty arthritis. Uh, this, is, this goes without saying, once you're carrying more weight than you are supposed to, you are at very high risk of getting gout and you're very high risk also of getting osteo, uh, osteoarthritis. Subfertility, we have a number of people who are trying to conceive they end up having hormonal imbalances. They have irregular menses if they are women. They have erectile dysfunction if they are men. And you can trace it back to obesity. And once they lose weight, you see that their menses get regular again. The erectile dysfunction uh, starts getting better. And some people have actually conceived after they have lost the amount of weight that they needed to lose. So, I mean, if we look at all this that we've gone through, obesity is, is a monster. It, it, it affects basically every part of our system from socially, mentally, physically, and physically the whole body from head to toe is at risk once you are carrying all that um, excess, uh, excess fat. Now, way forward. I know I've been battering you left, right, and center, <laughs> scaring you with all the complications, you know. I'm sure I've painted a gloom picture. I, I hope I have painted a picture that is gloom enough to wake someone up and try and do something. What is the way forward? I'm obese. I've understood this is my risk or even more because we didn't discuss everything. What do I do now? Where do I go from here? How do I overcome obesity? I know that some people who are listening to me are not Christians, and some are Christians, but I just want you to be patient with me and go through what I'm going to say to you now. Give it a try, and let's see how, how it can help you. Just, you know, I'm just appealing to you to give it a try. If we open uh, our Bibles to John 15, verse 5, it basically emphasizes, this is Jesus speaking, and he basically says, I am the vine, you are the fruit. And if you abide in me and you remain in me, you are also going to, if you, if you abide in me and I in you, you are going to bear as much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is what I want to emphasize. Sometimes getting over being obese and overcoming eating habits and all that, it's more like someone who is um, in rehab for drug abuse, you know? It's not just as easy to say, ah, well, I'll stop smoking, full stop. I'll stop using these drugs. I'll stop crystal meth. I'll stop DACA, and you walk away. Sometimes you try as many times, but you keep going back. And I know uh, among the people who are listening to me right now, there are some who have tried a number of times to get over obesity, but what, they lose 10 kilos, they gain 15. They lose 20 kilos, they gain 30. And some are at the verge of giving up. Do not worry, my friends. 
do not give up. Uh, try this Jesus, he can help you. Without him, we basically cannot do, uh, cannot do anything. And he loves all of us at an individual level. If you look at that John verse 2, he says, Beloved, I wish that you be in health. It is his wish that we are in health. My last verse is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. It says, uh, whether therefore you eat or you drink, do all to the glory of God. So I'm trying to put across to you that there is a way of eating and drinking that does not glorify God. And obviously God is not glorified in disease. Once we are eating and drinking in a way that's going to make us sick, we are not giving God the glory that is due to him. So let's go down this journey and see how best can we eat, how best can we drink, how can we change our lifestyles so that we can overcome this monster uh, of, of, uh, of obesity. I want to be quick to say, um, okay, I'll leave this slide on, but I want to be quick to say diets do not help you. Diets do not work. A complete change of your whole lifestyle is what helps you. So stop jumping from one diet to the other. The diet might seem to work. You're going to lose 40 kilos. When the diet goes, you gain back 50. So stop jumping from one diet to the other. Some diets actually have got very bad physiological effects on your system. I want to encourage you to take a deep breath, sit down, and adopt a whole new lifestyle, not just a diet. So the first thing here that I'm emphasizing is what we call temperance. Temperance is just self-control. To know when to say yes, when to say no, and when to say enough is enough. These attributes you must have. You need to know when to say yes, you need to know when to say no. You need to know when to say enough is enough. If I go back to you in history, for those people who read the Bible, you follow the children of Israel as they go out of the land of Egypt going to Canaan. God decides to give them manna. And when he was giving them manna, he gives them how to take it. He gives them a portion per person. He's giving them, and when they were gathering it, they had an idea of how much each person is supposed to eat. So we are supposed to know when to say enough. Gluttony is going to just make us pile a lot of other calories that we don't need, a lot of energy that we don't need, and that energy is stored in us in the form of fat. You need to know to say enough, I've eaten enough, I've eaten my portion, this is enough. Overeating and gluttony must not be part of our lifestyles. That's why I'm saying adopt a whole new lifestyle and not just a diet. Have a lifestyle of knowing when to say yes, when to say no, not just a diet. You must know when to say, okay, this I eat, this I don't. This I say yes to, this I don't. This I drink, this I don't. And this I drink, but this is enough. This I eat, but this is enough. You need to get to that point of having this balance. Then you're talking about food. Food is the big one, right? What exactly are we eating? I want to describe, to explain this phenomenon. Uh, I usually want to give a, a, um, an example of your bank account, right? You do have a bank account. Most of us want our bank accounts, you know, fatter than, <laughs> than thinner, okay? If you have a bank account, what remains in the bank account is a balance of what you put in versus what you put out. Just carry that to your weight. Your weight is a balance of what you put in versus what you spend. If you are putting in more and spending less, you are going to accumulate. And this accumulation is the fat cells that I'm talking about. This is the excess fat that you are carrying on you. So what you eat is what you are depositing. So when we are talking about weight, we actually want to spend more than what we are depositing. It's the opposite of your bank account. <laughs> In your bank account, you want to deposit more and spend less. But 
for this bank account called your body, you want to deposit less and spend more, right? And especially when you're already obese, right? I'm, I'm talking to that person who is overweight and who is obese. Already your bank account is fat enough. Your body is fat enough. We don't need more deposits, okay? We don't need a lot to keep coming. So what's coming? The currency is called food, right? The currency that you are spend, putting in is called food, or maybe we call it calories, okay? The currency that you are feeding in is called calories, and the currency you are spending is also called calories. That's fair, right? You're putting in calories, you're spending calories. When you are fat or fatter than what you're supposed to be, when you're overweight or when you're obese, there's too many calories in your bank account. You need to start spending them. And for you to win, you need to start depositing less and spending more. But here's the thing. We do not want you to starve yourself. You don't have to stop depositing at all because then that doesn't work. How long are you going to sustain starvation? Starvation is not sustainable. Before you know it, you have quit and you are eating even more than what you were eating before the period of starvation. We do not want you to starve. We still want you to eat. We still want you to deposit calories, but we want you to deposit as little calories as possible and spend more. So our stomachs have got uh, receptors. These receptors tell them that they are full, okay? So they have density receptors and they have stretch receptors. Once there is enough density in the stomach and the stomach has been stretched enough, it's going to say, whoa, I'm okay. So we want those foods that come in with enough density and enough bulk to behave enough for the density receptors to be bulky enough for the stretch receptors, right? So when you are eating, you want that food that has that form of weight and bulkiness. So you eat, you get full, but you have eaten very little calories and you are going to spend, then you know that your currency is moving well. Two calories in, 100 calories out. Three calories in, 150 calories out. And, you know, this is just a rough, rough example. I'm not saying go and eat two calories, right? It's not possible. <laughs> but I'm just trying to explain that what you are eating is way much less than what you are burning and you are not hungry. You going hungry is not the answer. So basically, this food that I'm describing, food that is dense enough for the dense receptors of your stomach, bulky enough for the stretch receptors of the stomach, and having little calories is plants. That's basically what I'm telling you to eat. Okay. So let's go. The key things. Eat plants, a variety of plants and eat them in their unrefined, unprocessed state. Because the process of refining removes the fiber, removes the density. So when you are now eating something that's processed, that's refined, the density is gone, the, the bulk is gone, and now you have something that's calorie dense and that's not going to fill you up. Sometimes I meet people who tell me, you see, I don't even eat much but I still gain weight. But I'm, I don't eat much. If I tell you what I eat, I eat just a toast and I eat, you no, know, maybe I don't even take cool drinks. Sometimes I take one or two cool drinks the whole day and I still get fat. So I tell people that this is not really about how much you have eaten, it's about what are you eating? Quality versus quantity. When you're eating the correct food, you do not go hungry and you do not gain weight. You do not eat any excess calories than you need. Actually, you eat less than you need and you get to spend more than you lose weight. So I'm saying plants, anything that is plant-based, anything that has come out of the ground, anything, any food that you can think of, Ask yourself, did it come out of the ground? Is it, is it plant-based? Is it, is it a plant, right? When you eat plants in their unrefined, unprocessed state, 
they give you the fiber you need for the bulkiness. They give you the weight you need for the density receptors. And when you have eaten, you can eat a very good meal, fill yourself up, because there's so much fiber in the food that you've eaten, you are going to be full for a longer period of time before you are hungry again. And because you're going to be full for a longer period of time, you basically have, got, you have reduced your intake, but you are not hungry. That's the key thing. Do not starve yourself as a way of losing weight. Fiber is so important because it's going to sweep out through your whole uh, digestive system. It's going to trap other stuff that's supposed to come out and it's going to make you full for a long time and your system is not going to use it because it is not soluble. You do not have enzymes to digest fiber and absorb it into you. So that bulkiness is just going to be there to your advantage. When people take plants and they process them, they end up with a bad starch. And I know when people are losing weight, the one thing they want is to drop starch. Drop starchy foods, they are bad for you, they are going to make you gain weight. I'm going to say, I agree with you if the starches you are referring to are the refined starches. They come with no fiber at all. They come with no nutrient rather because when they refine and they're taking out fiber, they take out other nutrients as well. So you are eating empty calories. So to my pup eating family, <laughs> drop the white pup. They have taken that mealy. They've taken the fiber. They've taken that, all the nutrients. They've taken that yellow, you know, that yellow uh, um, heart of that maize, right? They've taken it out, the gem, they've taken it out. They're just left with this fluffy, white, useless substance and they package it for you to eat. That's calorie dense. If you are going to eat that, you're obviously going to gain weight. So if you have to be eating your starch in the form of pap, make sure you do not use any refined mealy meal to make your pap. And I have encouraged people who want to eat their pap, rather do the small grain pap, like the mabele pap, right? That one is coming with all the fiber, with all the, you know, uh, all the nutrients in there. It's heavy, actually. It's also heavier on your stomach. You're not going to eat a whole heap of pap. Just a small portion, you are already full, you know, and you don't get hungry quick. So the white is the white pap, the white, the white super fine rice, the white, white flour products. They are our enemy in weight gain. And white flour products are consumed at a very high rate in this world. And they are readily available. I mean, just think about it. Beggar, that's the beggar roll, that's white flour. The bread we eat, white flour. The donuts, white flour. Cakes, white flour. Biscuits, white flour. Um, the bread, I know there's the, the, the South African favorite, the bunny cho. <laughs> it's, it's all, it's white flour. White flour products are an enemy to weight. You are going to gain weight. Um, what was the other thing? Maguinya, dombolos, making, you make those from white flour. They have so refined this flour that what's left is empty starch empty calories you are going to gain weight when you eat those and you are not even going to be full so you can eat three four maguinya maybe the fat is gonna make you say i've had enough or you're going to eat your your your, your dombolos and you're going to eat whatever the cakes though maybe the sugar from the cake is what's going to tell you that uh -uh, i've had it enough but you are going to eat a lot of the white flour products and still not get full or get hungry quicker. So because it, the white flour has come with no fiber, it has come with no, 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 you know, it's so processed, there's no fiber, there is no other nutrients that have been removed and it's calorie dense. So when you are eating these plants, my advice, do not eat refined plants. Eat them in their unrefined, unprocessed 
there's a difference between a baked potato and a packet of potato chips. There's a difference. It might be that that potato chips is, is whole, the whole packet is only two potatoes, but your two baked potatoes and your two potatoes that are in a packet of chips, that 125 gram packet, whether it's uh, whatever Lay's, Simba, whatever Willard's, whatever brand you are eating, those two potatoes in that packet carry way, way more calories than the two baked potatoes. So your two baked potatoes are actually going to make you full for longer than those two potatoes in a packet. You're going to eat those two potatoes in a packet and not even feel it that you've eaten two potatoes. And they carry way more calories from the way they are prepared, the frying, the, the oil that they have absorbed. And then on top of that, they put salt, they put uh, preservatives, they put color, they put all sorts of things. So I'm saying, try to eat the plants in as, as much as is possible, as unprocessed as possible. And your mode of cooking is also important. When you're cooking, we know deep fat frying is not healthy for anyone. So the way you are going to prepare your food, sometimes you're taking your potato or you're taking your sweet potato, which is a very low, a very low calorie food by itself, but then you are going to bake it with oil, with cheese, with, you know, you are adding a lot of other energy dense things in there. And in the end, the meal that you are having at the end of it is a calorie dense meal. So when you come to my rooms or when you go to the dietitian rooms, they tell you low calorie foods, potatoes, sweet potatoes. They're like, ah, I eat sweet potatoes, but no. The sweet potatoes that you are now eating have gone through so much additions that by the time you eat them, they've already put on enough calories to be equal to the potato in the packet, the chips that are in the packet. So get your plants, cook them, eat, but try to keep them as unprocessed as possible with very little additions. I know if you go on YouTube, you find so many cooking channels that can help you on how to cook that sweet potato for it to still be tasty and still be healthy. Instead of just using your data to scroll up and down social media doing nothing or just jumping from people's accounts to the other with aimlessly, use your data to help yourself. Go on YouTube, find these uh, recipes on our channel uh, 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 that you're watching this, if you click down, you're also going to see a lot of other recipes that have been posted and more recipes are going to come and you're going to get, um, you get good recipes that make you prepare your food, your plant-based food, prepare it in such a way that it remains healthy. You do not multiply the calories in the process of what? The process of cooking. The foods that we eat, let's make sure no added sugars. Be as free as possible from packaged foods. Because when they start packaging, they've done something to that food. These guys in the food industry are there to make money. As long as they make enough money, they are fine. You are responsible for your own health. Take your own health into your own hands and stop thinking that the industry is going to take care of your own health. Do not trust the industry, you know? A human being is very untrustworthy. <laughs> and worse, if he has set his mind on making money, they are going to do anything and everything that is possible, even to evade some of the laws and some of the regulations. They, they do whatever they can to maximize their profits. You cannot leave your health in the hands of people who are in business. Take care of your health. Be responsible for your own health. Don't even leave the responsibility of your health to your doctor because your doctor is not going to come into your kitchen and start throwing foodstuffs out and buying for you. You need to have some sense of, you know, some degree of self-drive to take care of your what? Of your own health. I tell, you know, sometimes I tell my patients, I appear to be a bit, a bit rude <laughs> when I tell them, you know what? I cannot live for you. You have to live for yourself. I'm here as your doctor to help you, but I can only help you as far as you allow me to. If you do not allow me to help you, what else can I do? 
if I diagnose you of your type 1 diabetes and I give you your insulin to use at home, you go home, you don't use your insulin, what do you expect me to do? How else am I supposed to help you? So what I'm trying to say here is if you want to lose weight, take charge of your health and make decisions yourself. Use your brain. Think before you eat. Do calculations. Ask what you are eating. You see the last point here I said, know what you are eating. Some people, you see them eating and you ask, what is in that thing that you are eating? They don't even know, but they are eating. I give this example always. I ask people, if you are a driver, if you own a car, are you going to buy any liquid that you see by the side of the road and put in your car? Everyone says, no. Why? Because it's going to harm my engine. And I'm the one who's going to get money to repair that engine. I need to make sure I'm putting the proper oil. I'm putting the proper coolant. I'm putting enough water. Then I say, I ask people, how many car repair shops have you seen around? Plenty. And in some places, you see three, four, five car repair shops in one line. But how many human being repair shops have you seen? Where human beings get repaired and get organs that are damaged, like we sell kidneys, we sell livers, we sell pancreases, we sell lungs, we sell hearts. Have you ever seen such a shop? No. So tell me, where are you supposed to put most of your thinking? Yourself or your car? If, you, if your car gets damaged, there's a million shops that are ready to repair. There's a million mechanics that are ready to take care of your car. But if you kill your liver, how many livers are there waiting for you? How many kidneys are out there waiting for you? When you've killed those two kidneys that we have, do we have a, a kidney special? No. So what it basically means is if you are a human being who thinks well, you are supposed to take care of your body more than you take care of your car. There is no body shop anywhere. Once your kidneys are gone, they are gone. If you are lucky, maybe you might get a transplant. Once your heart is gone, it's gone. If you are very, very lucky, you might get a heart transplant. Once your pancreas is gone, it's gone. So take care of the one that you have. Take charge of your health and decide what gets onto your plate. Know what you are eating. Try to run away from these fast foods. They are not your friend. They are just going to make you pile weight, get all these diseases. And you know, when you are sick, the money to get yourself treated comes from you. The fast food shops are not going to give you a percentage for you to go get healthcare. You, you, you eat fast food, you get obese, you get diabetes, you need insulin, it's on you and not on them. So you need to decide what gets onto your plate. Remember my slide. Know when to say yes, know when to say no, know when to say enough is enough. So as far as your food is concerned, eat a variety of plants as much as possible. You need that bulk. You need that bulk for your stretch receptors to work. You need that density for your dense receptors to work. You do not need the calories. So plants come as naturally cal low calories, very low calories. You can Google calories, cucumber calories versus chips calories, and you tell me. You can Google cabbage calories versus uh, uh, steak calories, and you tell me. So plants come naturally with as little calories as possible. They come bulky enough to stretch our stretch receptors. They come dense enough for our density receptors to respond. And when you're eating these plants, when you're preparing them, prepare them in as much, in unpro, as much an unprocessed way as possible. Stay away from the processed food. Stay away from the fast foods. The next thing is water is life. You want to lose weight? Drink water. Check out all the other things that are not water. Just drink plain water. Other sugary drinks, they're just going to come with empty calories. You're going to be in a state of chronic dehydration. Just drink water and stop taking all these other empty calories. And then you know that you are not depositing as much into your bank account. Remember, this bank account called the body, we say 
we want as little bank balance as possible. So deposit a little and spend more. Deposit a little via water and you spend more and stop with the sugary drinks. They come as huge deposits. Exercise. There is no way we're going to talk about weight loss without exercise, right? Uh, do exercise indoors, outdoors. Let your kids go out and play. Let them go out. Remember we said childhood obesity is also on the rise and it's very worrying. Get your children off the couch, off the screen. Let them go out. Let them play out. Exercise as well. Get them outdoors. They must do as much activity as they can. You also must do as much activity as you can. Remember, the activity is part of the spending, right? We spend through the systems that happen in our body already, the breathing, the talking, the heart beating, the, the lungs breathing in and out. All that is part of expenditure because that uses energy. And then when you exercise, you are adding onto the expenditure. We need to, to, to spend more. Let your expenditure account come up as quickly as possible. Spend as much as you can. Go out and work out. Whether you're doing weightlifting, you're running, you're jogging, you're walking, whatever form of movement you can do, you need to do it. But remember, you need to balance what you are eating and the exercise. You cannot eat everything and anything and then say, I'll go and exercise. No, it doesn't work that way. There has to be a balance. What you are eating versus the exercise. I have this chart here. I'm not sure if it's... Uh, if it's very, uh, can I collapse this a bit? Okay, uh, I'm gonna put you back, Connie. I've just collapsed this down yeah. so that the screen is a bit uh, more clearer. I want you to see the point that I'm making is you cannot eat anything and think you're going to exercise it away. Here is an average of how much exercise you need to do to burn up some common foods that we eat. One slice of pizza, you need to walk for about 90 minutes or run for, 33, for 43 minutes to burn it. <clears throat> French fries, the medium packet, you need to walk for about 98 minutes or 40 minutes of cardio. Donuts, 54 minutes of walking. Beef lasagna, one hour, 12 minutes of walking or 38 minutes of running. Chicken and bacon sandwich, one hour, 22 minutes, or 42 minutes of running. Fish and chips, the big one, <laughs> and a very common meal that people love. Some people eat fish and chips every day. Fish and chips, two hours, 30 minutes of exercise. This really shows you that you cannot eat anything and dream to exercise it away. I mean, who has two hours, 30 minutes of exercise every day? And you have not eaten only one portion of fish and chips. You have probably eaten fish and chips. You have eaten cornflakes with milk in the morning. You have eaten fish and chips at lunch, at work. When you go home, you're eating a beef lasagna. See how much you are, you are piling up. You are depositing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and then you spend very little. We need to deposit very little and spend more. I think I have overexpressed this. You need to get this balance. Okay. Right. I think I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. As a way of summary, we have really seen that obesity is a dangerous thing. It has put us on at risk, higher risk of dying from anything, higher risk of cardiovascular issues, lung issues, liver issues, digestive issues, cancers, and all that. So if you are carrying any excess weight, the time to start working on it is now. Do not carry it for any longer any day longer you need to get up now and start working and the important points that we looked at on how you are tackling obesity one is the food that you are eating try to eat as much plants as possible in their unrefined state leave the white things alone the white flowers white rice white pap white those 
those plant products, the starch products that they have taken out, all the starch or some nutrients have gone and it's all empty calories that you are now eating. Be careful how you prepare your food. Try not to put so many additives that are going to put the calories back. Be as unrefined as possible. Increase your intake of fruit and veggies on a daily basis as unrefined as you can be. Exercise, drink water, temperance, know when to say yes, when to say no, and when to say enough is enough. Get strength from Jesus. He's willing to help you. Remember the verses that we have read. He also wants us to be in good health. And also remember 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, whether therefore we eat or we drink, let us do it to the glory of God. God cannot be glorified if we are eating or drinking things or foods and uh, drinks that give us disease. So let's work together. Let's um, get a good support system. Get up, get this going. Contact us. You can contact us if you need further help, if you need personalized help. Wherever you are, you can contact us, um, uh, give us feedback, even in the comment section. Let us know uh, how you're going. Tell us how, what help you need. And if you are uh, close to any Seventh-day Adventist church, wherever you are, if you are close to any Seventh-day Adventist church, you have a right to walk to that church, ask for the health director of that church, and tell them you need help with your health. They are supposed to. Uh, they're supposed to help you, especially on the lifestyle changes. They've got literature, they've got uh, resources, they can help you and assist you, and you keep working with your personal doctor. The advice they give you does not substitute the, the advice that you get from your personal doctor or your personal health provider. Let's work together. Do Everyone must do the little that they can so that we can overcome this monster called obesity. Thank you very much for affording me this um, opportunity, Connie, and the conference for affording me this opportunity to share and try and shake people up. Uh, may God bless you and may God guide you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Matanda. Thank you for that very frank and honest presentation. Lots of information, lots to do, lots to think about, but I think too often we don't take responsibility for our own health. And thank you for pointing that out. And I trust that we will all do introspection and take responsibility and do something. Um, it's no use listening to all these things and not doing anything. For myself, um, you know, sometimes you hear things, but you need to hear it again and again. And yeah. so for myself, I have to take responsibility and do something. Sometimes we think when you get older, it's okay to put on weight. It's actually not because it's not okay for our bones. It's not okay to have more weight because we are predisposing ourselves to non-communicable diseases. So thank you so much, Dr. Matanda. Please, can you close for us in prayer? Okay, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, through the merits of Christ, we come before your throne. We ask that you forgive us for all our unrighteousness, forgive us for all our shortcomings. We praise your name and glorify you for giving us this opportunity to share a message with everyone. We praise your name, we glorify you for making this time possible. We know that if you had not raised your hand in our favor, this program was not going to be. But because you were with us, you were on our side, you, you have helped us for this program to be. Now we do ask for a blessing for everyone who has gone, who is going to listen to this program. May you bless them, meet them at their personal needs. I want to specifically pray for all those people who are battling with. Give them success, Father. Help them, give them information. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you might guide them each and every step we know that you wish that we be in health. May your wish be fulfilled in your children. Every one of us who is fighting weight, please help them and guide them. Be merciful to them and be gentle with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.